Thanks very much, Keith. And uh, welcome to everybody. It's um, when you walked in the door, the vibe was incredible in this room. It was really uh, vibrating with lots of enthusiasm, and I'm sure people networking and catching up. And for me, there's a, a lot of familiar old faces, and, and Des, I don't mean too old, but yeah, yeah. old faces, but old and familiar faces, and uh, lots of new ones. And I'm sure you're going to have a great time over the next two days. Um, as Keith said, uh, I've got the uh, great opportunity to be the CEO of Golden Break and CMA and it's a tremendous organisation and works with a lot of tremendous organisations around this region and beyond. Uh, but I also play a pretty important role within the Barmer Miller and that I chair the Icon Site Committee of Management for Barmer Miller, the Icon, uh, uh, Icon Site Committee. Uh, we do that jointly with New South Wales so we rotate that every second year and this year I'm in the seat. Um, so what I want to do, I guess, is just give a bit of an introduction to some of the values and key challenges for Barma Milloa, and then uh, hand over to some more intelligent people that will give you a lot more insight into the work they're doing and, and the opportunities it provides. So I guess for us, Barma Milloa and, and the state and the, and, uh, the nation, it's a critical, a critical um, uh, asset. It has tremendous uh, Aboriginal significance, and I acknowledge my uh, colleagues here, and, and certainly I, I jumped in too quick, I should acknowledge the traditional owners on the land upon which we, we meet today and, and pay my respect to their elders, both past and present. And Icon and uh, Barma Miller itself has tremendous Aboriginal significance for over the last 20,000 years since its formation, and probably at least 20,000 years before that when it was in a different form. Uh, Barma Miller is the largest river red gum forest in Australia. And then we keep expanding that, so it's the largest in the Southern Hemisphere, theoretically. Then it's the largest in the Southern Hemisphere, it's the largest in the world, and it's the largest in the universe, so it's bloody pretty important. <laughs> uh, it's a Ramsar site, so it contains a lot of uh, very significant water birds and a lot of uh, fleshly migratory birds because of the freshwater wetland types it contains. The majority of it is now a national park, shared between Victoria and New South Wales. As I indicated earlier, it is a living Maori icon site because of the significance of the floodplain. It has a, a strong history locally around grazing and timber extraction. So irrespective of your views around that land use, the locals really respect it and, and uh, acknowledge it for that previous use or that use. And now, importantly, it's becoming a very important site for tourism. So it's got some en enormous assets, enormous value, but it's also got enormous challenges. So one of them is it has a state border right down the middle of it. Um, shouldn't be a, a challenge, but often is. Um, it's got multiple agencies and a whole range of stakeholders interested in the site and they often have very, very differing views around its use and its value. It's had a very fluid funding background, um, albeit it should acknowledge that the Murray Darling Basin Authority and its predecessors have put a lot of investment in monitoring and research for a long period of time through the Natural Resource Man uh, Management Program in the early 90s, uh, the Bar Miller Forum in the mid 90s to mid 2000s, and in recent times, the Living Maori program, and, and Julia Reed is here from DSC has been a very major player in that as well. And then obviously other challenges about managing the water, the water that travels past it and through it. And water management is a very topical issue. It's a very topical issue in our catchment. It's a very topical issue across the whole Murray-Darling Basin. We've had a strong involvement in water management for a very long period of time. Uh, the CMA runs a whole range of sustainable irrigation programs. We're very heavily involved in the water policy reform debate and obviously probably the last 10 years, but increasingly so, a very strong involvement in environmental water management. We've been heavily involved in the Murray-Darling Basin Plan process. Um, a lot of our work driven by our board has been behind the scenes and commenting on the papers, but we're going to be intrinsically more involved in this implementation and certainly over the next six months or so as they develop a constraint strategy in our region, we're going to be heavily involved in that process. In terms of Barma Miller itself, obviously water management is crucial to its survival and its health. So Keith will be delving into that pretty shortly. He'll be doing the opening presentation, providing that background and a whole lot of knowledge around the water management. But I guess in general, it's becoming more specialised water management. We're a lot more accountable and we're becoming more specialised. So the, the environmental targets are becoming tighter around what we're doing. We're actually holding a lot, lot greater volumes of water which in this, in this catchment is critically important because we're also a, a very high uh, producer of irrigation produce. So a lot of the stakeholders that have seen water moving from a uh, consumptive use in your environmental water management are continually asking us what benefit has been generated out of that water moving. Um, so we're very conscious of having the information at hand 
which we haven't got yet, but we're getting it better and better, to actually put up that argument that yes, it has been a useful and very valuable transfer of water from one use to the next. The water management itself and the thinking is, is also continually evolving. So we use an adaptive management approach. Okay, you guys, every, everyone in this table or around this room will be using adaptive management the way they think. But it's about us understanding those hydrological and those biophysical triggers in the forest and continually adapting our thinking and our management to make sure that we're actually achieving those things which we're striving for. And a lot of that won't happen unless the work that you guys are all involved in, the research and monitoring, um, contributes to that. And, and there's been I think I've got written here two decades, I'm sure it's actually a lot longer than that. Two decades of fantastic research and monitoring conducted at Barma Miller or equivalent sites that are contributing to our thinking. Most importantly, that knowledge is being used inside this room, but also by the community. So the community are continually asking those questions like I referred to a minute ago with environmental water. Uh, I've got the colleagues from DSC here. Barma Miller community are continually asking questions. Bruce Werner relate to this in parks. We're continually asking us questions about the, the management of of uh, Barman Miller and, and where are we going, what are we doing next. So there has been some tremendous advancements in that knowledge. Um, so an example clearly is the, the use of uh, pulses down the river where we've actually promoted perch spawning that's some 10 times greater than prior to a pulse. So we know the use of pulses to actually generate fish breeding events. And now that becomes you know, a standard part of our management process. Same with water, bre water bird breeding. Um, we know uh, by manipulating the water in the system that we're actually able to maintain significant chick and, uh, and uh, egg uh, fledglings, um, which otherwise would be deserted if the water was actually going or it was being reduced naturally back or regulated back very quickly, then those, those uh, bird breeding events quickly diminish. Um, and we know that we can manage those things now. Likewise, through a continual wetting and drying regime, we're infecting, affecting and impacting on the vegetation communities. And we're also able to actually have permanent waterways within the flood plain of Barma Mellow to maintain those critical fish species and turtles. So there's a lot of knowledge we've captured over the last 20 or more years, and there's a lot more to go. And that's what you guys have got a critical role in that, and, and the next two days will really see us hopefully honing in on some of those needs, those R&D needs but also some of the information you've got in your heads or in your papers that you're sharing. Unfortunately, we find ourselves in pretty tight budgetary time. So I was just talking to some ex-colleagues earlier when I came in about their organisations. I don't think there's an organisation in a public sector in Australia that isn't going through tight times. Um, but that also emphasises why we need to continue to share this information because you know, we're not going to have the, the funding, at least in the short term, going into new R&D to the degree it was in the past. So the communication happening between you guys is critical and between you guys and the external environment. And it really is important. We've got a whole lot of great researchers here today, um, talking, and tomorrow, talking to you guys as researchers, but also a lot of natural resource practitioners in the room that actually will take that information and make some decisions with it, make, make some actions. So I really encourage you to continue to share that information, enjoy the experience that we've got here. Before I, I wind up, I want to make some special contributions or acknowledge some special contributions. So uh, the conference organisers, Keith and Joe, thank you very much for your efforts. I know this will really, really go terrific the next few days. To all the research and the presenters in this room, uh, look forward to hearing some feedback. Uh, funding support's really critical, so I, I made a comment about the murray Allen Basin Authority, but again, acknowledge their ongoing support. The state agencies, my own agency, but certainly Parks Victoria. Other agencies that have provided a heap of support for us over a number of years is the Victorian, I'll get this right, Victorian Department of Environment and Primary Industries. Previously known as DSC, previously known as DNRA, previously known as DCFNL. Keith, what else have we got? <laughs> um, New South Wales Department of Industry and Investment, Gold Murray Water, and the Federal Department of Environment, Water, Heritage and the Arts. have all been major contributors to the work of Barma. Um, also, make acknowledgement of the, the collective work as part of the Barma Miller Forum. Uh, that was a really important process that we went through with the community uh, and agencies back in the 90s and early 2000s, and we built on, upon that. And certainly, in, in more recent times, the joint management approach in Barma uh, Forest with the traditional owners, the Yorta Yorta Aboriginal Nations, represented by Neville and others here. So, we thank you for your involvement, Neville and your people, and thank you for your inclusiveness in, in letting us work with you. So together we're going to work towards improving the environmental outcomes in Barma Millowa. It's a significant asset in our catchment and beyond. Um, 
I've got to shoot off pretty early today, so I'll only be here for the morning session, but I look forward to hearing some ongoing feedback. And um, with that, I'd like to pass over Neville to do the official welcome to country. Thank you.